the story today uh, for the sermon is about a woman who needed to be healed. She's kind of bent over. Yeah, I did, thank you. She's kind of bent over. She needed to be healed. And so I want you to listen for words about how Jesus helped her. Think about the sermon. It's good to have you guys in worship. Sometimes the sermon feels like, ah, oh, such a big word. It's going to take a long time. It's not going to take a long time. And the sermon is no more than what we've done together. We told the story of the Good Samaritan today. A uh, sermon is like you read scripture, and then the person giving the sermon talks to us, talks to all of us, about what that story might mean. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to read a story from the Bible. You want to get your Bibles out, everyone? It's from Luke 13. And it starts with verse 10. And you all can read along. Get your Bibles out. And I'm going to pray. We do a lot of stopping and praying. But the reason we're praying right now is before we hear God's word, which is an awesome thing, we stop and we get ourselves ready to hear the powerful word of God. So get your Bibles, and then let's have a short prayer. Lord God, we thank you that we know you and that you've given us your living word that is ancient and always there and is true for us this moment. So get us ready. Get us ready to hear what you have to say, that you take my words to proclaim what you're trying to say to us this day and every day, and we come in Jesus' name. We love you, Jesus. And we all say, Amen. All right, Luke 13, starting with verse 10. Listen, people of God, this is his living word to us this morning. Now he, that's Jesus, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, it, synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on, come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his donkey, his ox, or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. One of the things that I am talking about children today. One of the things, I think, of, I think of the typical phrase that if you're with children, and you are, that people say, look at me, watch me, watch me, watch me do this, watch me do this dance, watch me do this trick, watch me do whatever it is, with such exuberance, and it seems like, at least in my um, family, I think it's probably true in yours, I never, none of the adults ever have enough energy to watch as long as the child does who wants to do the show. You know that? Oh, watch me one more time. Oh, watch me do it this way or see this. And I'm saying that as you're listening in a great way. There is such confidence, there's such joy in performing, in getting to show a skill. I love dancing. But I would be, I would say I'd be unable to dance in front of you the way I would like to. You know that feeling? Could we all get up and have a dance party? Maybe. But I bet you guys, some of you younger ones, could feel free to get up and just dance. You don't worry about what people are going to think. We learn as we grow up to be like, oh, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. You know what I mean. 
We're not, I'm not walking around saying, hey, come, come watch me dance. Maybe someday I will. It'll be a good thing if I do it. We get a little bit self-conscious as we grow older. We get a little bit, I think, messed up. And we think, maybe I'm not enough. Maybe I'm not good enough to dance here. So I'm not walking around saying, watch me. Keep that in mind as we talk about the story today. Today we meet a woman without a name who is step free. And at first you might think with this story that you don't have anything in common with her. But I'm asking you to listen closely to the story and I'll bet you're going to find many ways that her story touches you this morning. The healing stories in the gospel, especially in Luke, are never just about Jesus' power to bring back healing and physical wholeness. It's about all the whole life of the person being set free. So we have a story about a woman whose back is so bent and hurt that she's bent over and she can't see straight. So she's picturing, and if you want to, we talked about imagining today, this earlier this morning. She's bent over enough that she can't even look up. So she spends her days not looking at people's faces, but looking at the ground. Picture that. Picture being so, having your back and things be so twisted that you're just seeing the ground. When people talk to her, she can hear them, but she doesn't look up and see their faces because she can't. We don't know what the cause of this person's illness was. We don't know what happened to her if she had an accident. But Jesus talks about it as if the devil has her bound up. So whatever's happening there isn't just a physical thing. It's also emotional. It's her whole self is that way. We don't know. So Luke wants us to picture that as we hear the story. Now maybe none of us have that actual struggle or know someone. But I would say, especially to the older ones among us, <clears throat> that we know what that's like, excuse me, <clears throat> in terms of being kind of just a distorted view, right? Adults learn to kind of, unfortunately, see things differently. We hear the messages, we hear situations we've been through, and we start to think about ourselves as not enough. We're not smart enough, we're not good enough, we're not rich enough, we're not like our sister enough, we're not like our brother enough. And we start to feel the sense of shame about who we are. And that story comes from the very first story about people in the Bible, about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were tempted. They wanted to be, not just celebrate what they had, no, they wanted more. They wanted to be just like God. And when they did that, when they disobeyed God, the first thing they felt was shame. They felt ashamed of themselves, they said. And God said to them, wait, who told you to be ashamed? And it was the deceiver. The two different things, two different words that we use almost interchangeably, but they're very different. One is shame, and one is guilt. And we use them as if they mean the same, and I'm asking you to take a moment today to realize that they're different. Guilt is in the Bible. Guilt, the Apostle Paul says, is godly sorrow because it's the feeling we get when we've done something wrong. And we all do things that are wrong. When I know that I am guilty of something, God uses that guilt to bring about a change in my life. He speaks to me, and it means when I say that I repent, that I'm like, I did that wrong. I was, fill in the blank. I was impatient. I wasn't kind enough. I did something. I'm guilty of that. And that allows me then to say to me to say back to God, God, I don't want to be that way. I want you to forgive me and help me do it differently. So that guilt makes me closer to God. Shame isn't like that. Shame is a bad thing. Shame is something that we walk around and think, man, there's something wrong with me. I'm never going to be all right. We heap it on ourselves or we heap it on other people. Shame on you, we say. When we really mean, <clears throat> when we really mean, 
you need to change your way. But the shame word, we walk around and isolate that if we feel shame. We keep away from each other. We keep away from God. And shame says you're never going to be good enough. You're too messed up. Shame is believing that who we are is wrong. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to stop and think, I made a mistake, but I can do better. Not that I am a mistake myself. So let's get back to this picture of the woman who's bent over. Now, it's amazing that day that Jesus even noticed her. Picture this church full of people, crowds of people here, all packed in. Or picture another room like that. And the woman would have been, <clears throat> women were sat clear in the back, although you guys both sat clear in the back. Women in the synagogue sat clear in the back, back, back. And so she would have been by the door. It would have been hard for Jesus in this crowd to see the woman at all. Because not only is it packed and she's far away from him while he's speaking, but she was bent over, so she was already smaller and bent low. So it was difficult even to see her. The service started, and she's in the back with the other women. And it's amazing that Jesus notices her. Jesus, if you'll remember and see again in Scripture, always notices the small things, the birds, the lost coin we're going to talk about, the lost sheep, a little man up in a tree. He notices the little things and the little people, and he sees this person way in the back. And he doesn't just notice how small and bent over she is. He turns kind of his gaze on her, and he sees what's important to see on that day. First of all, this woman doesn't come into the synagogue to worship. It doesn't say anything about her that she was hoping Jesus would be there. She doesn't try to push to get close like other stories. She doesn't tell herself that she just touched him. She's just there. She's just there. She doesn't have to say anything. She doesn't have to beg him for anything the way we see in other stories. She's just there in his presence, and Jesus notices her because his eyes, just like I was having the children look for the lamp, his eyes are looking and always on. All he says, Jesus says, is she's healed. Puts his hand on her and she's healed, and she, for the first time in 18 years, stands up straight. All of that's gone. Now, you may not have had that physical healing. I just came through something recently in my life that was tough, emotionally tough. And I said to my daughters, oh, I think I'm taller. And they're like, Mom, this is not. I'm not really. I just feel lighter and taller. Do you know what that's like, adults? You do. You're, when you're in, in the middle of something, you're tensed up, you're bent over, and she stood up straight for the first time in 18 years. And the first thing she saw when she stood up was Jesus' face. How cool is that? Jesus knows that shame keeps us away, keeps us bent over, keeps us looking at the wrong things because we lose our perspective. He is stronger than anything that happens to us. He can set us free from the shame. So she sees him. And the people around her, the religious leaders, always the bad guys in these stories, says, you can't do this on the Sabbath. You can't mess up a church service. This is important stuff. Do it some other day. And Jesus said, I haven't violated the Sabbath. I fulfilled it. Because what it means is, when we are together and we worship, we are fulfilling healing and health. It's hard to imagine what it was like for her that day, but we understand a little bit about it. We know that she went from there totally changed. Everything about her life was different, and she even had a new identity. Jesus says, the only place in Scripture, he calls her a daughter of Abraham. He's saying she's in the line of the problem, just like we are. We are people included in the story. 
When we are caught up in either shame or a physical issue or something that we're trying to avoid talking over with God, we can't see him clearly. If we're in the middle of self-focus, you know what that's like. You're going through a hard time and all you think about is what's wrong and, and what have I done wrong. And you, you're looking down all the time, literally, just like she was. Shame keeps our eyes on ourselves. And while we're supposed to be aware of what's going on, we are healthier when we take our eyes off ourselves and our problems and not get so twisted up and to God. All of us have burdens. All of us here today have something that's bending us down and twisting us up. And the healing happens because Jesus sets us free. And it also happens in community. It happens when we gather here together. It happens to see each other's faces and we hear God's word together. It happens when he says, you are part of the promise. You are part of the story. That's where God shows up. When we think back to that first image of the dance, of dancing around, of saying, look at me, that's the feeling that Jesus literally wants us to have. That we don't have to take a sense of futility or nothing is ever going to be changed. We can say, God set me free from that. And let me be free to maybe not perform for others in a dance, but have my eyes open and have the shame be gone. I don't have to focus and worry and think, what did I do when I should have done that and all the regrets. I can put that down. I can look up, take a breath. I can stretch my arms out. And I can praise God that he set me free. And we can all just dance together in the life of faith. And to God be the glory. Amen.